Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Royals Rundown Podcast, a Kansas City Royals podcast presented by Royals Review. If you want to keep up to date on all things Kansas City Royals, you've got to go check out RoyalsReview.com, a great team of writers over there. Plus, you can find Royals Review on X and on Facebook at Royals Review. On today's episode, we have a jam-packed slate of things to talk to you about. First off, we got to talk about what the hell Frank White is doing in Jackson County. Plus, some good news, actually, regarding broadcasting for the Kansas City Royals. I'll, I'll absolutely take that. And lastly, Jeremy and I are going to start off a new series as the season is almost upon us. But I already said his name. You already know who he is. My lovely co-host, Jeremy Greco. Jeremy, how are we feeling tonight, man? All right, so we, we're not the premier Kansas City Royals podcast anymore? No, we're, we're not the premier Kansas City Royals podcast right. anymore. I All ran, right. I, I got a little lazy on the synonyms, okay? <laughs> I, I, need more, I need more spice in my wordage, so we're, we're going to take a step back, and we're going to prove that we are the premier All right, Kansas I'm a, City Royals I'm gonna, podcast. I'm going to give us a boost right here, all right? Ooh, I'm okay, going okay. to pull out a Seth Kaiser classic. From the the pod the Chiefs podcast, formerly known as uh, Times Ours, Times Ours, now known as you know the name. You don't know yeah. this name. It's uh, only, only strange, only game. weird games, only weird yeah. games. There, that that makes more sense. Uh, so he likes to describe memes, right? Because this is an audio <laughs> medium. So I'm going to describe a meme for you. Okay. You've seen the memes. There's actually multiple variations of this meme format. So imagine the whichever one you want. Where the like the top half is like the like confused or like I don't like this, and then the bottom half is like no, I do like this, right? So there's yeah. a couple variations of that one. I think one is Chris Brown, another is the the blonde chick, right? Oh yes, yes, yes. Um, so you got those, but flip it around, okay, for me. And okay. The, so the first one is like I do like this. This is great. Is me watching Chiefs playoffs football. With a wind chill factor of negative 30 degrees Friday night, I'm watching all the players, I'm watching all the coaches, I'm laughing, I'm dying, I'm like, these guys look so cold, this is hilarious. <laughs> and so then the second panel now is going to be the, I don't like this so much, and that's me taking my dog out this morning when it was nine <laughs> degrees. <laughs> Oh yeah, I'm uh, I'm absolutely feeling that, Jeremy, because we're we're both out here on the on the East Coast. Um, a little bit more in the southern region, if you will. I don't consider Virginia the south, but a lot of people do, apparently. And it it got down below freezing for a sustained period of time. I just lost the kitchen sink and the washing machine because my pipes froze. <laughs> because oh, they no. Don't, they, they, don't, they don't put insulation around the pipes because it doesn't get that cold around here. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. So it is. Uh, it's going to be a fun few days. It should be warming up here uh, later plates. on this week. Would you say paper plates are yeah, your future? Plates. It is. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how how this works out. But hey, we're, we're not here to talk about dirty dishes and laundry. We are here to talk about the Kansas City Royals, Jeremy. And I, I will say, it seems funny the universe when we we start gearing up for a podcast. And usually I'll message you Monday, Monday night or something. Say, hey, you up for the podcast Tuesday night? And you say, sure. It's like, well, crud, what are we actually going to talk about? Like, there, there's nothing to talk about. And then, bam, we get news on Tuesdays. Like, that's that's just how it works. I, I absolutely love the universe taking care of us in that fashion because we got a couple of big headlines regarding the Kansas City Royals I, today. I just want to double check first. You okay. You know that we're recording this on Wednesday night. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, I absolutely knew that. Okay. I just, I just want to make sure. You threw me off. <laughs> I don't, I don't know what you're doing. Honestly. I mean, oh. maybe, maybe it's Tuesday and I've lost my mind. No, 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 no. That's, anyway, uh, th that's me. That's we we me. did get a bunch of news. So we should talk we about did. that. Yes, we did. We did. First off, let's go ahead and, and talk about Frank White. So Bob Fesco of 610 Sports, the Kansas City um, sports radio host, I think he hosts from like 6 to 10 on 610. Um, he said, quote, I'm told by a source that Frank White wants the teams to pay the county, Jackson County being, $25 million a year, but will not 
say why or what the money will go towards. And that was compounded later on with, you know, saying that White is expected to veto the measure and there aren't enough votes to override. So this is a uh, we're, we're getting into a new we're getting, we're getting into a new chapter of this stadium saga. As you can tell, my dogs aren't very happy about that. Um, I'm not very happy about that because I just want to talk about baseball. I don't want to be talking about, you know, taxes and votes and things like that. But, Jeremy, I I do want to ask you, are you surprised by this? I think when we talked about it last, we both agreed that the votes ta- tallied up, excuse me, to override the veto. But something might have changed. And I don't know what's going on behind closed doors. I don't know what's what's going on with Frank White. But, frankly, I think a lot of people are tired of it. Well, uh, just first, I want to make sure that we have my credentials here. I am the <laughs> expert now on yes, you are. The, the Royal Stadium nonsense. I, yes, you are. I've been featured on KSHB 41, and uh, obviously I have all of the answers. Go watch the video down to the podcast description. Uh, anyway, yeah, so this is ridiculous. <laughs> That, that's yeah. all this is. Yeah. I, I have complained and pointed out issues and everything else about the way the Royals have handled this situation. And I have kind of tentatively praised Frank White's approach to the situation. I cannot defend, like, if this is truly what is happening, he's just saying, hey, teams, give this city $25 million a year. And I'm not, I don't even know what I'm going to do with it. Just give it to us. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make sense to me. I, this is not part of normal tax collection. This is, this is just like, this is just like holding a ransom note. It's blackmailing the teams. I don't, I do not understand this move. The teams are like, please give us some tax money. And he's saying, no, you give us 25 million in, and I'm, I don't know how that compares to the tax money the teams are taking necessarily. Yeah. Like this is, it's just, it's bonkers. It makes no sense to me. And I don't all like, I get that between the vote where eight of nine council members voted mm-hmm. to put the measure on the ballot. And now that negotiations must have happened behind the scenes to convince them to change their votes when it comes time to override the veto, if they're not going to override the veto, because eight out of nine would have done it. I, yeah. But I don't know what those negotiations could possibly have looked like. Oh, it's yeah. not like, again, like I said before, it's not like they didn't know what Frank White's position was. Mm-hmm. And surely these people aren't like, yeah, the, the, the team should give us $25 million a year without any plan for spending it. I, they, that can't be what's going on here, right? I, I That's in the public eye. That is exactly what's going on, Jeremy. And it's. It is so frustrating. I I get it. We can all we can all be picky and choosy about when we want true democracy to to ring, but the fact that this isn't even going to hit the ballot and that Frank White is gatekeeping this from taxpayers is frankly ridiculous. Because this isn't just the Royals that this is affecting. This is affecting the Chiefs as well. A team gearing up for the divisional round in the playoffs. You know, folks are going to vote for them. Yeah, I. This is like the flip side of some of the complaints I was making earlier in the process where I said, Mm -hmm. you know, like city and county legislatures in other districts have just kind of pushed through uh, bills to to give stadiums, uh, to give the teams money to build their stadiums without really letting the people vote for it. And now we're kind of getting the flip side of that where they're not letting the people vote for it. (laughs) And it's just like, why shouldn't I mean, I, again, I am opposed to public dollars going to the building of private stadiums. I'm opposed to that. I will always be opposed to that. But at the same time, I'm also not super like happy about the government just being like, yeah, uh, well, we want twenty five million dollars and they're not giving it to us. So you can't even try to vote for it. I just yeah, that is just bonkers to me our our governmental system is 
It need it, it could use some updating. Let, let's yeah. just put it that way. Are are you saying it's like Kauffman Stadium pre renovations? Is that is that what it is? It need, it needs I'm, a little, I'm saying little that our governmental work. system has some concrete cancer, and we should uh, we should address uh, that. So if I'm if I'm understanding the math correctly, that 25 mil a year comes over the 40 year lease that was yeah. proposed. That is one billion dollars. That Frank White wants back from those Which teams. Seems, I, I, if I understand correctly, that's more than the tax pulls in. Uh, I think so. I think it, I it's got to be. A, it's at least a significant chunk. Right? It is. So it then, is what's the point chunk. of the three eight cents tax? It almost uh, seems like he's just like he's just making stuff up to just refuse now. Well, the, that wouldn't be the first time this. No, this it wouldn't be. <laughs> but th- it's just like we're not even pretending anymore, which is also I, I don't know if that's a thing I prefer or a thing I, I don't prefer. I guess yeah. like I've always wanted politicians to not pretend, but it wasn't that I just wanted them to just say asinine things excuse me for the explicit tag i guess that's straight to my face and expect me to just accept it that's yeah. not what i was looking for here <laughs> no not not looking for that at all so listen if you want to hear bob fesco's like full words on it he talked to Car- carrington harrison excuse me on the drive this afternoon i will have that linked down in the podcast description so you can just go click on it read it um i'm sure that by the time you're listening to this on Thursday morning, then you will uh, you'll be able to hear more of his thoughts on the 610 sports radio show in the morning. But let's go ahead and pivot away from this, Jeremy. This is yeah. there's no there's no good in talking about it anymore. There is some good news regarding the Royals. I understand what? that neither one of us are in the Kansas City market. If we want to watch the Royals, it's MLB TV. For the for the most part, now with all this stuff going on, with the with Diamond and with Bally's, and just all this money hanging up in the air for these broadcasting rights, good things are coming for Royals fans. I will say that, according to Travis Sawchick, I think is how you say his last name. Excuse me if Looks I if I butchered me. that. What did you say? Looks good to me. Hey. He reported, or he clarified, excuse me, that the Royals are one of five MLB teams broadcast that will be available via Amazon Prime after Amazon kind of, I, I want to say bailed out the... Uh, it's the phrase the, I'm hearing. Or, yeah, kind of bailed out, gave a good amount of money to this sports network. And he did clarify later on that these are the five MLB clubs for which Diamond slash Bally holds the streaming and linear cable rights. So I remember what what was the name of that streaming service, Jeremy, that they tried to get off the ground? Do you remember that? The Bally, like the Bally Sports Go or something like that, where they wanted I, people to I, pay like 20 bucks a month. I don't remember that, but sure, that seem, seems like a thing that would happen. <laughs> It didn't it didn't last very long. I only heard bad things about it. But hey, the Royals, in all intents and purposes, the Royals should be available on Amazon Prime Video wherever you're at. And I think that is okay, Jeremy. Yep, you go go and correct me on that. Uh, so in a later reply on his thread, uh, Travis did mention that it seems like Amazon will only be streaming into the local area. Okay. So if you're outside the local outside the local area, you're still gonna have to get MLB.tv. I was very excited when I first heard all this because I was like, I already pay for Amazon Prime. I do not want to pay extra for MLB.tv if I don't have to. And it's not confirmed. There, there's still a lot of rumor, conjecture, and unconfirmed reporting happening right now. Yeah. So it could end up being that you and I can just watch the games on Amazon Prime. Also, like the games on Amazon Prime are supposed to include the pregame and postgame show, which Ooh. I would love to finally love have access to outside of the Kansas City market. Yeah. But um, the latest I've heard is that Amazon will only be streaming inside the Kansas City market. It's also unclear if it will be a part of the Prime package 
or if you're going to have to pay an extra fee on top of Prime, like you do if you want stars or, or you know, any of the other add-ons that you can get for for Prime. Yeah, and I it will be interesting to see how this all develops. Like you said, Jeremy, we're still very <sighs> premature in this whole process. Still a lot of litigation, legal mumbo-jumbo. Yeah, it has, to, hasn't to been through. officially confirmed by the courts yet either. So no, it, it has not. So... These are just reports. Take, take them for, for what you will. I I am personally excited for the Royals fan base there in the Kansas City Metro, if that is the case. Um, because it, it's, like, it's a positive step, no matter yeah, how you look at yeah. it. Like Even if they're only streaming locally, like, okay, Amazon Prime Video is, you can cut your cord, you don't have to have your cable, you don't have to sit here and go, oh, which stream, like, is YouTube TV going to carry it? Blah, yeah. blah, blah. You could just go, okay, Amazon Prime's got it. A lot of you probably already have Amazon Prime. Um, <laughs> it's a, it's a good deal if you don't because you're getting, you know, the package delivery, the all that, the all the library that Amazon Prime has, which there's some good stuff on there. There is. There is. Um, like The Expanse, uh, for example, <laughs> is a I good show on there. I saw about that. <laughs> uh, so, you know, there's, there's some stuff worth watching on there. So it's, yeah. it's, it's a good deal if that's it how it ends up working out, because even if you're only paying to watch the Royals games, you are still getting access to their entire library of other stuff. Whereas us paying for MLB.TV, we only get baseball. Correct. And in my case, at least I only get the Royals package. So I only get the Royals. Yeah. Same here. Um, the MLB TV package that I use just shows me the Royals broadcasts and yep. like the free game of the day. Yeah. If I want to watch it. And then like, I get all the audio for the other teams as well, if I want it. So, I mean, for, for us out of market folks, I don't think that this is going to change anything right now. Um, I, I will be keeping my ear out for details regarding that because that's, what's going to affect me the most. But, it just seems like whenever whenever we talk about the Royals period, that blackout is just the I, I, don't, I don't know how to say it. It is such an issue amongst the fan base. It's not just the Royals fans. It's all the other teams as well. These blackouts kind of make it difficult to watch the team. Well, and it's like the the, the blackout ranges are so big right like you can't you can't stream mlb.tv royals in iowa yeah because they're in the blackout range but you're not going to a live royals game there and you may not have access to a cable channel that will show you the game so you just aren't allowed to watch and yep. that's that's just it's ridiculous. And with the advent of streaming like the blackout stuff is especially bad cuz it's like well I don't want to pay a cable provider anymore. I personally don't pay a cable provider. I and I know a lot of other people don't either. I just have my streaming services. So being able to fold that into a streaming service is, mm. is, is good. And I think Amazon getting it is going to be good for getting rid of the blackouts in general, because I think that they're going to want to, you're showing me the blackout map and how yeah, crazy right. it is right now. Um, know, right. I'm, so anyway, but Amazon's going to want to broadcast everywhere. There, there's not going to be, they're not going to want to restrict the Royals to the local area. Why would they? They're, there's not as much money in that for them. So they're, they're going to keep pushing to broadcast nationally and I, or to stream nationally, I should say. And so I think that's, that's where this is going to go. I think this is where it's been going. This is just another step in that direction. Yeah, very, very much agreed. And Jeremy, I, I wanted to pull up the map because I, I didn't believe it when I first looked at it. Does the Royals blackout range go down to New Mexico? Am I seeing that right? Uh, let me look at this here. It um, definitely covers. I see it. I see Kansas, Nebraska, Missouri, Iowa, Arkansas, Oklahoma. Um, that that might be a. That might be a little bit of New Mexico down there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, that's, that's that's just hard crazy. to tell because the way they've got it in here. But yeah. it, I, I do believe I see some of that pink color that they used for the Royals for whatever reason. I uh, yeah, I don't know why they why they use that color. But it's uh I I just really hope that this 
is a smooth transition, something that gets done before the 2024 season starts. It's got to. It's got to, right? It's well, got I mean, to. That's, that's what we talked about last go around when Diamond slash Bally's declared bankruptcy before the 2023 season. Not wrong. And like we were, you know, remember everyone talked about the infrastructure and who was going to pick up the rights and yada, yada, yada. Well, lo and behold, for the Royals, at least, that it was just Bally's all season. So it'll be it'll be interesting to see what happens there. Game day internship with the Omaha Storm Chasers is the perfect opportunity for a college student interested in exploring a career in the sports industry. Storm Chasers interns have the chance to work in almost every aspect of game day and event operations at Warner Park while gaining knowledge about the inner workings of minor league baseball. There's no better way to learn and grow while discovering your passions and goals than becoming a part of our Chasers family. To learn more about internship opportunities with the Storm Chasers, head to omahastormchasers.com or email Ania Tate, A-N-I-Y-A-T, at omahastormchasers.com. Everyone get on your feet, stir up the storm, we're family. Baseball season is on its way, and there's no better place to spend the summer than with the Quad Cities River Bandits. From the Royals' top prospects on the field to a jam-packed promotional schedule, the fun never stops at Modern Woodman Park. Can't miss any of the action? Ticket packages are on sale now. With full season plans starting at less than $5 per game, Season ticket holders enjoy premium perks, including guaranteed giveaways, team store discounts, a full season parking pass, and so much more. For more information, visit riverbandits.com or call 563-324-3000. But Jeremy, we, uh, we spent a lot of time talking about off the field things for the Royals. There's a lot of exciting things that are coming in 2024 for these Royals. I would like you to introduce what we're going to do or one of the things we're going to do leading up to next season. All right. So uh, spring training is really just kind of around the corner. It is. Um, I know that we're, some of us are experiencing single digit or negative temperatures (laughs) right now, and it could feel like baseball season is forever away, but it's, it's coming up fast. It is. So uh, we thought that it would be kind of fun to do kind of some roster projection stuff. And um, I'm actually probably going to write this weekend a, a, a projection for the 26 man roster. Okay. But um, we are going to go ahead and do uh, a segment, like a weekly segment leading up to this, where we're going to talk about kind of the depth chart for the different positions. So this week we're going to do starting pitchers. And then we both came up with a list that we think are the top 10 starting pitchers that the Royals could kind of rely on this year. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's kind of a mix of who, like who's, who's up first and also like who, who are guys that we hope are going to kind of move through the system very quickly or think might move through the system very quickly and might have a shot to pitch this year, especially if injuries come for anybody. Um, so should we, do we want to do this where we each give our list and then we compare the differences or do we want to go like, here's number one. Do we agree or do we disagree? And or how do you think we should do this? How do you want to do this today? You know what? I I would like to go one by one. All right. So for example, our our number one choice was it was it was clear to me at least. It wasn't much of a contest. We both selected Cole Reagans yep. for that number one slot. Um, my pick to be the opening day starter with how hot he closed out the twenty twenty three season. Jeremy, like do you do you have any reservations about putting him number one? Uh, you know, there's there's always got to be some reservations mm-hmm. just because uh, it was a half season. It was a half season. It was. It was. And, and that is a small sample size, as they say. Yeah. Uh, and and so we got to see him do. And we 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 saw Brad Keller pitch very well over small sample sizes. You're right. You're right. Um, so we got to see him do it longer. But right now, there's just there's nobody who has that upside. Yeah. Um, that's at that level. There might be some guys lower in the minors who have some of that upside, but Cole Reagans is, if he's not the number one, then they don't have a number one right now. Exactly. Um, they, they might have some number twos and number threes, and we're going to talk about that real quick in a minute. But if, if he's not the number one, there isn't one. So <laughs> really hope he's the number one. Really hope. Yeah. Right. Yep. Ho- hoping so. Hoping so. But we, it didn't take long for us to disagree on the pecking order. 
Um, number two, I put Seth Lugo. Number two, you put Michael Waka. Yep. I will say I think they're a little interchangeable. Yeah. Um, for what they bring to the table next year, I do want to ask you succinctly: Why did you put uh, Waka above Lugo? So my tiebreaker was the fact that you put Lugo above Waka. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> but also Waka has more of a history as a starter, whereas sure. Lugo has been a reliever until last year. So I think there's a little bit more of a of an of a history of being successful as a starter there. Mm -hmm. um, Lugo and I'd have to pull up numbers to double check, but I think he was a little tiny bit better than Waka last year, just a tiny bit. Yeah, um, but they were both better. pretty good. But again, it was Lugo's first year in the rotation in a while. So yeah. um, I, I gave the nod to the guy who's been doing it for a little bit longer. Okay, fair enough. And in that same vein, though, that's why I put Lugo above Waka, simply because there's a lot more mileage on Waka's <laughs> arm than there is on Lugo's. Like, I'm looking at their career numbers. Waka has 1,288 career innings compared to Lugo's 641. So, like, that is an insane difference. I understand that Lugo, like, they're, Lugo's actually older than Waka, which mm -hmm. I don't think I quite realize since Waka's been around for so long. Mm -hmm. um, I think Lugo, Lugo, excuse me, still has more, more left in the tank compared to Waka. I think Waka's still going to be a solid pitcher, don't get me wrong but I think the ceiling is a little higher on Lugo than Waka. But I think they have very similar floors, yeah. at least. Well, and, and there's a reason that uh, we we just flipped them, because yeah. you've got Waka third and I've got Lugo third. Exactly. So they're, they're, very, they're very close to each other. They are. Um, so then we go to number four. Yes. And that's where we have an agreement again, as yes. it turns out. Uh, we both think Brady Singer is probably the fourth – Let's let's call them the most important, the fourth most important pitcher for yeah. the Royals this year. How, yeah. And, and, and so, all right, give me give me your pitch. Why is Brady Singer the fourth, the fourth most valuable, the fourth most important, the fourth highest on the depth chart, whatever well, you want to call it? Man, it was it was such a, a tough season to watch from him mm -hmm. last year at points. Um, I will say his expected numbers were a lot better than what you look at the box score. You know, it's it's not easy to look at the box score and see a, a 5.52 ERA, but he also, I think he led all of MLB in the difference between his ERA and his FIP, <laughs> where his FIP was 4.29. Like, that's that's still not great. I'm not saying, like, that's amazing, but that is much more in line with what you would expect from Singer <laughs> is that production. Um, I think he just needs, I think he needs to go down to number four in the, in the pecking order. Mm -hmm. Um, if not for psychological reasons, for motivational reasons, yeah. maybe. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it felt like in 2023 coming off that hot 2022 second half, he was kind of the, he was in the running for the opening day starter job simply because he was the better out of a lot of bad options yep and we we've all talked about how these offseason additions have raised the floor of the 2024 royals well raising the floor you know raises the quality of competition that brady singer is going to yeah. have to face so it's kind of sink or swim time in my opinion what do you think jeremy i think that brady singer being at number four this year i think he would have been number one at the beginning if we were doing this at this time last year yeah I think we both would have had him at number one i think having him at number four is really good for the royals especially for that competition aspect you were talking about because i think the only thing that is ever going to inspire brady singer to to work on more secondary pitches <laughs> is the opportunity to lose his job yeah um and the royals I think one of the issues and I, you know, one of the issues was Cal Eldred, but mm -hmm. also another of the issues was Brady, they look at Brady Singer and say, you need to throw a change up. And he's like, yeah, what's going to happen if I don't? Well, you're not going to pitch as well. Are you going to take me out of the rotation? Well, no, we, we can't afford we to can. do that. Exactly. So uh, now as the number four starter entering the year, maybe 
maybe we can afford to take him out of the rotation. Maybe, maybe he goes into the bullpen if he won't learn to change up and he doesn't have success. Maybe he goes to the minor leagues. Um, and, and the other thing about Brady Singer that I, I really prefer him being number four and is something that we haven't talked about a lot, but other people have mentioned that I think is interesting is the lack of innings pitched um, mm, on his yeah. part in any single season. Yeah. He he does he's not an innings eater by any stretch of the imagination. And so you don't want a guy who's not going to give you very many innings at the top of your rotation. No. Um his future might end up being in the bullpen simply because he's he's not really much of a workhorse. But uh you know, maybe he can figure some of that stuff out and solidify himself as a middle rotation starter. Um if you get the best version of Brady Singer as your number 4 starter, I think you're looking at a pretty good rotation. Yeah, I I think you are. And Jeremy, just to double down on your rotation point of him maybe falling out of the rotation, in my mind, it's you know it's the traditional five man rotation. Mm-hmm. So we we saw these Royals go to a, a four man rotation with an opener in yeah. in For 2023. most of last year. Out yeah, of necessity. Yeah, yeah. Just and that was mainly due to injuries. I I will right. say. Well. Uh, and- ineffectiveness on the part of brad keller because i don't know how injured he was when he wasn't when he was still in the minors rehabbing but he was not throwing strikes true true well hey we don't we don't have to worry about that anymore he is still to to my knowledge he's still a free agent yeah i haven't heard anything about anybody giving him anything which is uh kind of it's kind of disappointing but let's let's continue talking about our royals uh we did agree again on number five with mm. Daniel Lynch no, we the fourth. What'd you say? We didn't agree on that. What'd you say? My number five is a completely different left-handed pitcher. Oh my goodness, you're right. You're right. I was my my dumbass was looking at my list. <laughs> yes, you do agree with your list. That's Whoa. good, Jacob. I <laughs> am glad crazy. for That's that. That's wild, isn't it? Yeah. yeah you I have oh. I oh, have God. Chris Bubich, the man. Oh my gosh. And if Chris was you, you told me that he's not even on your top 10 no, list because not. he's hurt right now. Yes. And so here's my thing is that we expect him to pitch sometime this year. So he's That's on true. my list. And if he was ready to pitch at the beginning of the year, he'd be ahead of Brady Singer for me. Ooh, that's a hot take right there. But he, listen, everyone, we were talking about small sample sizes earlier on. Chris Bubich for a time in 2023 looked like the workhorse that this rotation needed and was performing very well. So I am interested to see what he is when he comes back from injury. Um, I know, I know we've kind of memed about how much I love Chris Bubich, but yeah. I want to, I just want to explain for a second here. And then we'll talk about Daniel Lynch. Cause we do need to talk about him too. Yeah, we do. Um, he has shown multiple, multiple flashes of being yeah. at least a mid rotation starter. He just keeps flashing it. He had that almost no hitter against the Cubs. Oh, yeah. And, you know, he keeps being like, he's almost there. He's almost there. And then he's inconsistent. Mm -hmm. And with the Royals new approach, I think that consistency can finally be found for him. And I just refuse to give up on a guy who's shown as many flashes as he has. Yes. Has he been very bad at times? Yes. But he's shown (laughs) more flashes than anybody. Uh, Brady Singer might have had more better starts, but it was like all in one chunk. Chris Bubich will give you five or six great starts in a row. You know, that five or six bad ones, five or six great ones, five or six bad ones. And so it's just like he keeps coming back from the bad. Yeah. And I, I can't give up on a guy like that. No, I I think that's absolutely valid. It's it's wild to think that we only saw him for three starts last year, uh, but he still had a point five F war yeah, in he those was, three starts. He was the leader and pitcher F war for a good chunk of the season. Yeah. And he's he's still like the Royals best option in FIP with two point six three. Like that is like that is almost Cy Young level worthy but of course like we said it's a very small sample size now it's time to see what chris can do um post injury he is arbitration eligible in 2025 so we should be seeing more of chris after he's fully recovered and we got to remember he's not even 27 yet yeah he's gonna be 27 in opening or sorry when the uh when 2025 season starts so he's he's got a he's got a good amount of time left uh, before we can say he's done or not. 
Um, so Daniel, you've got Daniel Lynch's number five. Yeah, I, I do have Daniel Lynch's number five. And I guess it, it's a little hypocritical to talk about not putting Chris Bubich on my list and putting Daniel Lynch on my list. Well, at least he's healthy. Well, I'll uh, give you that much. Yeah, is he? Is he no? <laughs> he was pitching in the, one of the winter leagues somewhere, wasn't he? He was. So he was pitching in the, in the Arizona Fall League, and he did he did okay in the Arizona Fall League. Um, but he was just he was just on and off the IR and restarting Dang. rehab assignments and things like that. He only pitched no, fifty two and a third. Thank you. I'm I'm football football yeah, brain man. Yeah, I know. I got you. <laughs> Every um, year when when football season starts, I'm talking about the white the Royals ride receivers, and every year when baseball season starts, I'm talking <laughs> about the Chiefs left fielders. <laughs> Which that would be a fun exercise to talk about, <laughs> what, like what players should be playing where. Yeah. Um, but back to Danny Lynch, he only appeared in nine games last year, fifty two and a third innings pitched across those, and he wasn't like particularly stellar. He did have a couple of good games. I remember that that seven inning showing against the Detroit Tigers as one that was absolutely stellar, but he wasn't. I don't know. He just wasn't living up to expectations. The strikeout stuff just wasn't there. He wasn't inducing a lot of ground balls either, um, which is what we want to see from our starters in Kauffman Stadium. Is you know a higher ground ball rate that'll be better. He just wasn't inducing those. So. It's a little, I don't know, I think a lot of people are out on Daniel Lynch right now calling for him to be a bulk guy in the in the bullpen. And I think if he's not 100% healthy heading into the season, I think that will be his role. Because mm-hmm. we are going to talk about Jordan Lyles does appear on both of our lists. And unfortunately. I, un- unfortunately. <laughs> and I think if... I think if health wasn't a concern, Daniel would be a lock for that number five spot in the rotation. But health is a concern, and that's where things get a little dicey for him. Still only has 252 innings pitched across his entire career, which it seems like we've been seeing Daniel Lynch for a long time. <laughs> and it uh, it just hasn't been always been there for him. So it's a little sad. Yeah. It is. So then we move to number six, where you have Jordan Lyles. Yes. Would be the first man not in the rotation if yeah. you had your way. Uh, and I have, just to completely throw a wrench in the works, I have yeah. Alec Marsh. So first, talk about, you tell us why is Jordan Lyles as high as six for you? So I... Which, not high. Let's be clear. That's yes, not high in not, a ranking of 10 starting pitchers. But it's it's higher than four other guys. It is. It absolutely is. And so once it got down to the number five spot, it was like, okay, who do I want to see make a start? Yeah. Like, who do I want as a spot starter, as a guy to come in and mainly give the team some innings? Well, I... I'm going to use the talking point again. That was Jordan Lyle's value in 2023. He did pitch 177 innings in that season, and that that's where most of his value was. Now, was it great? No, it was not great. No, it was the it was downright great. bad for a good chunk. I will say he got marginally better than the second half of the season, and him improving also helped the team simply win more games because he wasn't throwing them away. Um, I I don't know. It's I thought about putting Marsh above him, mm-hmm. um, but I I do want to very wanna much hear, didn't. Oh yeah, spoilers <laughs> for later in the list. You very much did not. <laughs> I wanted I want to hear your thoughts on Marsh though. Uh, so. My thing about Marsh comes down to a single number. Oh boy! One, on, I got to pull it number. Up. I thought if I said that, I would have it pulled up by the time I finished <laughs> saying that. That number is ten point two nine. That's his K per nine. That's his K it? per nine rate. The yeah. dude strikes guys out. He does. He strikes really does. them out. And I just cannot believe you cannot convince me that the guy who, okay, let me do this. Let me look at this splits real quick. 
I know we've done this a million times. I'm doing it again. Mm-hmm. As a starter, 7.64 ERA 30, in 35.1 innings over uh, how many starts? Eight starts. Then he had yeah. nine relief appearances where he pitched 39 Multiple. innings. Yeah. So it was very similar innings per appearance numbers there, but a 3.92 ERA. Yeah. You cannot look me in my face and tell me that this this man is only a reliever because he sucks when he starts and he's good when he relieves. Because this is not like he's pitching one inning in relief. He was a bulk man in relief. So there's something yet to unlock for him. Yeah. Or there was some really bad luck as a starter. Um, you know, probably he's, he might not be a 3.92 ERA guy long term, but if he's a 4.5 ERA guy, that you'll take that as your fifth or sixth starter, mm-hmm. I think. I think. Um, and and I think that that's that's a possibility for him. I think that the starters ERA was a little overblown. Uh, the relief ERA was also what he had later in the year, so it might have just been a matter of figuring some stuff out as he went along. Um. I just I have high hopes for him and and I, the one thing I want to say about Lyles because I have him later in my list but we're not going to really talk to him about him when we get to later in my list yeah the one thing I want to say about Lyles is that my biggest problem with Lyles he does have value in the innings he can pitch but in an evaluation season I wanted to see the Royals evaluating a bunch of guys yeah. not just sending a guy out there because he can eat innings um, and, and yeah, you don't want to overwork your, your, your young guys. You don't want to promote people too fast, but they could have signed a whole bunch of, you know, different, uh, free agents, uh, yeah. minor league free agents or guys who were looking for bounce backs, um, just give them minor league deals and, and give them a couple starts each and, you know, see what you can get. Maybe you strike gold and then you can trade them or you sign them to extension, whatever, um, my problem was just that like, okay, but you're every time Jordan Lyles is pitching, you are not evaluating anything Yeah, because Jordan Lyles is Jordan Lyles. Even if Jordan Lyles is a little bit better than he was last year, which he probably will be, you're going to have that mm-hmm. as they call it a dead cat bounce. Um, <laughs> he, he is who he is. He is as old as he is. He's not coming back in no. 2025. It's not happening. No, nope. unless he turns into the next Garrett Cole or Jamie Moyer, or I don't know, um, just somebody who's really good. It's he's not coming back. No. So it's just, it's, it just felt like a waste of a roster space and a waste of innings that they could have been using to evaluate, not just their own minor league talent, but other free agent talent to see if they could find some holes to fix. All right. So we're going to move on yes. to number seven now. Yes. Um, and that's where I have Lynch. Mm-hmm. Because I just, I like Marsh. Uh, Marsh has shown to me he's flashed a little bit more. And so I'm kind of prioritizing guys, I guess, with a little bit of flash in okay. Bubich and Marsh. And you're fla- you're prioritizing guys who are more likely to actually start the year in the rotation. Fine. <laughs> Be that way. Uh, I get it. Uh, but then you've got Mason surprise. Barnett, which is yes. a guy some people may not have heard of. Yeah, um, and I wouldn't fault you in the slightest if you hadn't heard of Mason Barnett. He is a 23-year-old righty still in the minor league system. I'm pulling up MLB.com's um, rankings. He's the Royals' number 12 prospect right now, um, ahead of guys like Anthony Veneziano, um, where, ahead of where Alec Marsh was when he was still on this list last year. So he's not like a super high ceiling guy, even in the Royal system. But he is performing very, very well, I will say so far. Hard um, to argue with those minor league stats. Yeah, if we're so he went from high A to double A. Um didn't split time evenly, 16 starts in high A and then seven in double A. But he had very good success across both levels. Mm -hmm. Um, he had a 3.3 FIP in high A and a 3.05 FIP in double A where double A is kind of where a lot of Royals pitchers struggle. They struggle to make that transition. They struggle being in that Northwest Arkansas stadium. It's, it's just a big adjustment for them. And that wasn't a problem for Barnett. And I think that the stuff will play at the major league level. Um, I, I don't have 
Well, hold on. I do. Give me one moment because I cannot remember if he is a non-roster invite. I don't think he is, unfortunately. I do not believe so, no. Yeah, I'm not I'm not seeing. Oh, he wait, no, just no. barely made it to double A. No, he, he is actually a non-roster oh, okay. invite. So that is that's gonna be very interesting to watch him in spring training. Obviously, the Royals organization has high expectations for him. Now I'm not saying just because he made it to spring training, he's gonna make his MLB debut this year. But we've seen it multiple times in recent years where the Royals have pulled guys from double A to make that jump to MLB, even if it is just pulling a starter to be a reliever or make a spot start, things like that. I think that if if you had to hit the emergency option, there are worse options than Mason Barnett in the organization. The one caveat about Mason Barnett, and I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a curveball at you because oh, I've boy. gone back and forth about my number ten, and I okay. have Barnett as my number ten in the message I sent you, but I'm gonna actually switch it back to Chandler Ooh. Chandler Champlain. Okay, um, and we're just gonna go out of order here for a sec. <laughs> Mason Barnett averaged fewer than five innings a start at double A last true. year. Yeah. That is a problem for me. The stats are good, but he, I, he can't be that close to MLB ready to me if he can't even average five innings a start at double A. Yeah. So that's, 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 that's why he's not as high on my list. Um, so then next up, number eight, you've got Anthony v- Veneziano and mm-hmm. I've got there's where I finally put Jordan <laughs> Lyles in there. So talk talk to me about Veneziano. Veneziano. Um, Veneziano. However listen, you say it. I, I do believe it is said. Anthony, Anthony V. Tony V. Hey, listen. He uh, he would fit right alongside Vinny Pascantino, right? Yeah. Vinny P and Tony V. Let's go. Hey, I like it. I like it. Sounds like something out of The Sopranos. Um, <laughs> but Anthony, he did make his MLB debut last year. He only pitched like two and third innings, I want to say. Um, he, I'm, I'm trying to think of how, how to explain why I'm so low on him, I guess. The, there isn't a whole lot of upside, in, in my opinion. Um, he is, he's good enough, but he, he has struggled in the minors, and he struggled last year in the minors. Um, let me, here, let me pull up some of his stats because it wasn't, I'm trying to think he was kind of a late season option for the Royals. Like he was, he was a guy, well, I mean, we got to call someone up Mm -hmm. and he was kind of the best performing guy in triple a at that time. Mm -hmm. So they called him up, but even just looking at his, let's see. So he spent most of 2023 in triple a 17 starts there. He had a 4.22 ERA, and we all know how important FIP is to me. He actually benefited from having a lower ERA because he had a 4.62 FIP in mm-hmm. AAA. Now, this this is where we're going to get really analytical for a second. He he walked more batters than he struck out in his limited MLB appearances. Not 2.1 a, innings. Two and a third innings. I, I know. You're going to read into that? Yes, I, I am going to read into that. All because, right. Because walks were an issue for him, even in AAA. He had 4.32 walks over nine, compared to only 7.93 strikeouts over nine. Yeah. Not a not a great ratio, if you ask no, me. No, you want at least a two to one, and that AAA ratio is not good. And the reason why... That. The reason why I like FIP so much is because it it measures what a pitcher can control, the mm-hmm. aspects of that game. It is fielding independent pitching, after all. His expected FIP, according to Fangraphs, was 8.51. And I get it. It's Okay, too- but XFIP can do some weird things in very small sample sizes. That's Yeah, I, absolutely. And I that's, that's what I was about to say. Small sample size, I'm not saying that I'm completely out on him right now. There's, I've seen the calls for him to be the fifth man in the rotation, and I think he will be in that battle during spring training. I'm just not very high on him right now. Yeah. Maybe if I see more of him, maybe I will be. But when I watched him in limited action in AAA, I didn't see a whole lot that impressed me. The, the control was very erratic at times. The pitches don't have a lot of strikeout potential. His fastball and slider are are solid. 
that's that's about it. The changeup needs needs some work, um, which is why I think he might slot in well as a bulk man in in the bullpen this season. But as a starting pitcher, I'm pretty low on Veneziano. Which I think you had Veneziano next on your list, didn't you? Yeah. I'm yeah. over here defending Veneziano like you got to give him more credit than you're giving him, and I've got him lower on my list. <laughs> um, yeah, well, let's so hear it. Man. I have him after after Lyles just because uh, at some point the you got to have the what somebody's done before I think has to come before what somebody might do. Jordan yeah. Lyles has been an innings eater. He's been a guy that you can count on to go out there and take the ball every five days. We don't really know what Veneziano is going to give us, what Tony V is going to give us. I got I I literally <laughs> pronounce his name differently every time I've said it. Tony um, v. I'm I'm learning from you. Yeah. Um, and so happened. yeah, yeah. I mean, the the double A stats last year were great. Eight starts, 42 and a third innings, 10.2 K per nine, 1.06 BB per nine. Yeah. But that BB per that BB9 was an outlier for him. Um so it's I'm I have hopes that he can figure some stuff out, but he's obviously not there yet. Whereas I think Jordan Lyles, you at least know what you're gonna get from him. Um, yeah. and, and I do think he's going to be better this year than he was last year. Um, so then you at number nine have Alec Marsh. Yes. You said you almost put him above Jordan Lyles, but then you dumped him three spots <laughs> lower. Um, you don't like Veneziano, but you like Marsh even less. Talk, talk me through that. Why, why, why Veneziano over Marsh? Well, and I think this is, and you pointed it out earlier. I think subconsciously I was ranking these a little bit more by starter potential. Mm-hmm. Um, and we we saw a good amount of Alec Marsh. I I do like some of his individual pitching metrics. I will say the the home runs kill him. They yeah. they, they absolutely kill him. They do. And it's like his home runs over nine were worse than Jordan Lyles. And we talked about all that stuff about Jordan Lyles. Well, Marsh was not a was not much better, unfortunately. So I'm I'm a little torn on Marsh. I probably. Honestly, I probably should have put him right below Lyles, but I I ain't gonna back down on that too much because <laughs> I think I think Barnett, Veneziano, and Marsh all have similar starting potential and starting chances in 2024. Um, I know Barnett's kind of the outlier there, but Veneziano, Marsh, um, they they both had similar roles at a certain point in 2023. So. I'm I'm interested to to see what they do in spring training. I really am. All right. So then at number ten, I've got I'm subbing in Chandler Champlain for yeah. Mason Barnett, and you've got Noah Cameron. Right. So I'll I'll go ahead and go first and just yes, say yes. that um, Chandler Champlain had some of the best numbers in the minor league systems as far as ERA and FIP last year. Um, he made more starts at Double A, pitched more innings at Double A than Barnett. Mm-hmm. So I, I was kind of, I, like I said, I've been going back and forth between the two of them this whole time. Um, you might have seen when I first said it, I did have Champlain as number ten. And then mm-hmm. I looked at Barnett's numbers, and I was like, oh, but those are pretty good numbers. But then I was like, oh, but the innings pitched. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm finally, I'm, I'm settling on Champlain. Okay. Um, I think that. If you got to go to the minor leagues, he's the guy to go to. I think his ceiling might be a little bit lower than Barnett's, but uh, I think he's closer to being MLB ready than Barnett. So okay. that that's where I'm going for number 10. Uh, Noah Cameron, that is not <laughs> a name I've thought very much about. Uh, <laughs> talk to me here. Why is he in your number 10? So let's see here. I want to I want to double check that he's not on the top 30. I don't know. He is. He's at number 18 right here. OK. For the Royals. So right. Right around Barnett then. Yeah. Um, well, Barnett's yeah, 12, I think you said they're they're in the same range, I will say. Yeah. Um. So Noah Cameron drafted back in 2021. A local guy grew up in uh, in St. Joe. So I think that's that is pretty cool. Um, unfortunately, he had Tommy John back in 2021. He had some injury troubles in 2022, so he was a little limited. 2023 was his first full season. Um, I need to tally up how many starts he had. He had 24 starts across High A and Double A, and I will I will admit the results were mixed. He looked absolutely great in High A, 14.91 sure 
strikeouts over nine compared to only 2.31 walks over nine. Now, those regressed a little bit to the mean once he hit double A, and he had 17 starts in double A. I will say that. So he had a good amount of seasoning there in 2023. Um, and I, I, I'm going to I'm going to admit something here. I would I would love to tell our listeners, hey, I went all off of gut and and watching baseball and watching film and things like that. For this exercise, I put Cameron here simply because of not simply, but he got the edge because of fan graphs. Okay. And I pulled up their projections for the 2024 season. And I want to clarify, this is the steamer 600 plate appearances or 200 innings pitched projection. So this calculates out the totals for a pitcher or batter across that respective amount of work. Mm -hmm. And Noah Cameron regarding pitcher F war actually came in number eight in the projected pitcher F war across 200 innings. Um, that system pr would project him to have a 4.64 ERA across 32 starts. And um, and that was well above guys like Alec Marsh, Mason Barnett, Jordan Lyles. Um, I wanted to, did I have anyone else way down here? No. Um, I think the lowest guy that we have on our list now is Chandler Champlain, who slots in at number 13 on that pitcher F war list. So, Cameron, I think he has some really good stuff. He has some, and his changeup is great. Absolutely great. He can dot the corners with the best of them. The fastball leaves a lot to be desired. Um, I need to go back and watch some of his worst starts in 2023 to see how he reacts. Um, and he might be a guy who ends up as in the bullpen, I will say. Um, but I liked his approach to start 2023. Um and I think his he just got good stuff, man. And I think stuff plays at the MLB level. Yep. So so before we get to the end, I do want to mention, I think we're going to do relief pitchers next week. Yes. I'm looking at you. Yeah, we'll do relief pitchers next week. I think, did we decide on how many we were going to do? Um, Let's, I'm trying to think. That way let's everyone else can play along at home if they want. Yeah, of course. Um, Let's go ahead and do, let's go 15 deep. Why 15? not? All right. Yeah, sure. Um, okay. But I, bef before we, we wrap things up, because we are getting kind of long yeah, in the tooth yeah. on this one, I did want to mention one starter that both of us Ooh, left off of our list forget. that I think is kind of interesting. Okay. Jonathan Bolin did not make yeah. either of our top 10 lists. Yeah. So run me through why he missed your list, and then I'll run you through why he missed mine. <sighs> I, you know what? I was just talking about Cameron and his and his post injury stuff. Um, Jonathan Bolin. I don't think there is a guy who had. I'm trying to think of the word. Who had his ceiling decrease as much over the past two seasons than Jonathan Bolin? He, for a time, he was the best prospect from that 2018 pitching class. He was the most promising guy. Mm -hmm. um, but I I looked at his limited action in AAA, and I just I was not impressed. The strikeout numbers weren't there. The walks were were even more of an issue. Home mm -hmm. runs were an issue, and all that happened on a on a below average BABIP. So yeah. I just wasn't seeing enough to where I felt comfortable putting him on this list. And with his injury concerns, you know, how many innings can he actually pitch? That's yeah. still that's still a concern for me. Yeah, um, basically, I'm I'm in the same place. Just to to mention, seven point seven nine K per nine, four point three BB per nine, one point six one Homer per nine. It's not where you want to be. A five point two five five point two four ERA and a five point six zero FIP. Um, the interesting thing to me is that he is projected to a four point four one ERA and a four point four five FIP. Um, yeah, they they. The steamer and FGDC do not think his strikeouts will go down much um, if he pitched in the big leagues next year compared to his AAA numbers. But his walks and home runs would go down quite a bit, they think. Mm -hmm. So chances are he's in the rotation um, just 
for the sake that he's in, he pitched a lot in AAA last year. He's probably in the rotation before Barnett, before Champlain, yeah, so. before before Cameron, maybe before Tony V. Um but probably after pretty much everyone else we've mentioned. Yeah. Um, so that, that's just kind of where he is, 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 is he's an uninspiring guy right now. And, and that's not to say that he doesn't have any potential. Obviously he once had potential mm-hmm. and he's still only, how old is he right now? He uh, is 27? 27 years old, just turned 27. Yeah. So he's, he's not old, but he is old for a prospect. Correct. Old for a guy who was not pitched at the big league level at all. Um, minus whatever, like one or innings. two innings last year, three innings last yeah. year. Um, so it, it, I think we just kind of were like, we hope the Royals aren't relying on him. We want to have a little bit of, he, if he's on this list, he's at the bottom. And I think we were both looking for a little hope at the bottom. <laughs> little, yeah. well, that's why Mason Barnett and Chandler Champlain. And like, we're looking at guys who haven't, who haven't been in the big leagues yet. Cause the, 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 the taste of the unknown mm-hmm. is so exciting. Yep. And I'm, I'm, I'm just going to keep, I'm going to hang on to the steering wheel for dear life here. And I'm just going to say, I'm, I'm taking us to the end here. We're ready to do our Royals review reviews, Jacob. Hell you yeah. Go first today. Whoa, 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 whoa. Easy there, killer. Easy there. First no? off, I do. No, no, no. I do just want to double check. You're going to take the wheel back. If, I can't remember if, Bolin should still be on the 40 man, right? Yeah, he is. I wasn't seeing him in roster resource, so that was a little confusing for me. Um, okay, Royals review. Listen, I've just been watching a lot of the cr- crown lately, and I know that I reviewed that last time, so I'm not going <laughs> to review it again. Um, I am going to review Roombas. So I know that my wife and I are probably really late to the party for the remote vacuum cleaners and stuff like that, but we got one as a Christmas gift. And I will say having multiple dogs and having that Roomba is a godsend. It is absolutely great. Um, I also want to review their, their customer service. We got one with a, with a bad battery and like no questions asked two days later, we had a new battery on our our front step and it was, it was great. Uh, Really appreciative of that because those things are pricey. They're not, uh, Um, so I absolutely love, love my Roomba. It's, we use it on laminate floors, so I can't speak for how it works on carpets, but it works wonders on laminate floor. So if you want a Roomba, if you want to be lazy like me, go get one. Highly suggest it. Uh, if you don't have a Roomba or a shark or something like that, you're missing out. Why are you spending? You're either manually vacuuming, which is a lot of time spent that a robot could could be doing for you. That's true. Or you're not vacuuming at all. Which is, I don't, I'm not here to judge you, but that's, that's going to be murder for your allergies. <laughs> um, today I am going to review, I'm going to go a little bit off the wall here, okay. right? I'm going to review the video game reviewer, Ash Parrish. Okay. Interesting. She, uh, I think primarily writes for the verge. I've heard her on a few different podcasts. Um, she's just terrific. Okay. She's smart. She's clever. She writes well. Um, she has good opinions on games. For for one thing, she thinks that uh, Marvel's Midnight Suns is a very good game. That's got some flaws. <laughs> Why am I not that surprised? Out Why am huh? I not surprised? <laughs> um, but she actually got me to play For Spoken, which was a Square Enix open world RPG that came out er- about this time last year, um, and I finally played it and. While I will say it is not going to crack my favorite games list anytime soon. Um, in fact, I when I finished it, I, I was prepared to just hate on it so hard. <laughs> like you have no idea. Yeah. But then I asked she she directly I she was talking about it and I replied to her tweet, or retweeted her, just kind of asking people in general, like, should I play this mm-hmm. next? Like I have it, I own it, I pre-ordered it so I could get the steel book. Because I was like, black female protagonist, I want to support this in video games. They don't have, they don't exist in video games. They don't. I can't think of another game that has a black female protagonist that's not like create a character. That's can't true. think of a single one. Um, so we need more of those. So I'm like, I'm gonna support this, and I pre-ordered it, and I've had it for a whole year, and I haven't played it. I'm like, should I play this? And she replied to me, and she was like, Yeah, play it. All right. So I played it. And then I was like, I'm not seeing the appeal here. So I went to her and I'm like, 
I, I Googled her review and she had a spoiler for your review. And I'm like, okay, but I really need you to dig into this a little bit more. So mm-hmm. I tweeted at her again and I'm like, do you have a spoiler review? And she's like, yeah, kind of, here it is. And she gave me a link and I read it and I'm like, oh, this is what you see. This is what I didn't understand. So now I'm like, okay, maybe it's, it's not, it's not Midnight Suns. Yeah. Midnight Suns is, is better still. Um, but it does have some redeeming qualities that I hadn't noticed uh, until she kind of pointed them out. So um, that's to, to my way of thinking, that's what a really talented analyst uh, can do is, mm-hmm. is help you to see things that you didn't see before. Um, I know a lot of us go out there looking for reviewers and analysts who just confirm our pre predispositions. Yeah. And, and uh, there's nothing wrong with a little catharsis doing that. Um, but finding a reviewer who can change your mind on something is also very precious. It is. So if, if you want someone who can do that, I do recommend you look up Ash Parrish. She goes on Twitter by the handle at Ash Parrish, A S H P A R R I S H. Um, so give her, give her, give her a read. See, see if, see if you like anything she has to say. I love it. And just just like with anything that is analyzed by people, there is there's a big divide between the majority of analysts and the best. And you Mm -hmm. you notice that with her work, I will say. Um, So a a great review there, man. Love love you highlighting her. That is going to do it for us tonight on the Royals Rundown podcast. Of course, this podcast is made possible by the team over at Royals Review. Please go check out their work at RoyalsReview.com. A lot of a lot of good stuff, not just preparing for the season, but looking at past seasons. I have loved Bradford's pieces, some history pieces, you know, answering like who's the fastest Royal of all time or what what the hell is the elephant doing with the Royals of old and things like that. I I have loved those pieces. So please go check out his work and all the great work that's over at RoyalsReview.com. You can also find them on X and Facebook at Royals Review. Jeremy, any closing thoughts before we get on out of here? Go Royals! <laughs>